All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so happy that all of y'all have taken the time today to, to join us. Um, welcome to our incredible speakers, uh, cybersecurity enthusiasts, and aspiring future technologists. We are RockSearch, a global specialist staffing firm. Uh, welcome to our virtual event, where we'll talk about cybersecurity, how it impacts our everyday lives, and how we can leverage it to create opportunities for underserved and underrepresented communities. The anonymity of the internet is almost a thing of the past, and now more than ever, our data, our identities, our lives are online. With that in mind, it's paramount that we do everything we can to protect that data. There are two things every single one of our speakers have in common today. Not only are they leaders and experts in the world of cybersecurity, they have a passion and desire to ensure that there is a path forward for those interested in creating a career and life for themselves in the industry. Today, 25% of the cybersecurity workforce is women. Only 9% are people of color. Considering the wealth of opportunity in the industry, these numbers are shocking. So let's dive in and learn how we can support these leaders and the community around us in being pioneers of change. Welcome to our event on service through cybersecurity. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jen Nelson, who will be moderating our panel today. Jen is a global technology transformation leader. She started as an engineer herself and quickly transitioned into engineering leadership. She is currently an executive in residence at Big Ben Software, and her accomplishments are a shining example of what's possible for women in technology. She does everything she can to give back to her community and serves as co-chair of 5050 Women on Boards, an organization dedicated to providing collaboration, support, and upskilling for ambitious women looking to take on more senior leadership roles in their industries and organizations. Uh, Jen, we are so excited to have you, so I will go ahead and pass it over to you to moderate the panel. Thank you so much, Renee. I appreciate it. Thank you so much to Rock Search for bringing visibility to this topic. And I'm thrilled to have with us five amazing people across different facets of cybersecurity. Um, depending on your orientation of the video, we first have Tim Amerson, who is the deputy CISO for the Social Security Administration. So he has touched everybody on this panel and probably everybody joining one way or another. He's also a fellow board member and community member of what we know um, very warmly in uh, Texas. I'm from Austin, the Texas Cyber Summit. Um, on the call with us next is Jackie Flores. She is the information security officer for Kinview, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. She's also lead instructor, excuse me, instructor for something called Correlation One, which is a professional training and coaching organization. So I encourage you guys to check them out. Candace Williams has just joined us on the call on the video. I hope you see her um, on your screen. She's associate director of cybersecurity at Raytheon. And she also leads a company in a community called Cyber Ally, Cyber Ally, which I love the play on the name there. And that assists people with cybersecurity career planning. So if you're not yet in the field and you're thinking about getting into the profession and one of the multiple facets, um, she's definitely the person to connect with. We have Tish Work on the call with us, who is VP and General Manager of Cybersecurity and Intelligence for Lockheed Martin. Um, she hires hundreds of specialists, um, many with top secret security clearance, especially veterans who commonly have top secret cyber uh, security clearance. So if you have a TSS, um, definitely check out Tish. Last but not least, I can only introduce her as Cecile. Cecile is a real life hacker. Um, she is on a team called X-Force Red uh, at IBM and they do nothing but penetration, uh, penetration testing. Um, but Cecile has graciously carved out time from her calendar today to join us on the panelists. So thank you so much to everybody joining us, ladies and gentlemen. I first want to acknowledge that when you hear um, the word cybersecurity, it encompasses so much and there are so many facets to a career in cybersecurity. It doesn't have just um, one, one niche. There are so many aspects to this career that even if you've got tangential skills and you want to get into cybersecurity, um, I think the panelists in the discussion today will show you just how vast and varied it is. So you're going to be able to find something 
that really leverages your skills. So keep your ears open, keep your hearts and minds open. And if you think you've got some good skill that you can contribute to get into this field, we highly encourage it. Um, and these are some amazing people that you can reach out to, to connect with, to, to get into this field. So with that in mind, um, Jackie, I wanna start out with you. How did you find your passion for cybersecurity? What was it that made you think, oh, that looks like a good career. I'll, I'll, I'll jump into some of that. Great question. So I always knew and had a passion for technology growing up, um, loved computers, just loved, you know, I loved playing games on computers and all of that. So um, that was always a big part of my life. And I knew that for my career, I wanted to end up somewhere in technology. Uh, um, I ended up going to the University of Texas at Austin. So uh, I'm from, from Texas. So um, I ended up studying management information systems there. And, you know, combining both business and IT, because I knew that I wanted to work in tech, but I wanted to, you know, have you know job security and stability. I came from a very, very troubled and rough childhood. So that was very, very important to me. Um, when I graduated, I ended up working at PwC as an external IT auditor. So that's really how I started getting my foundational knowledge of IT, databases, operating systems, right? How it all works together. Um, and at that point, security and, and cybersecurity started um, kind of the, the target, the big target breach had happened, right? So security started being in the news. People were aware of it. From an external audit perspective, we were then required to start asking our clients, okay, what are you doing for cybersecurity? So that's really where I got introduced to security when I was an IT auditor and I was really interested. I had a knack for it and I ended up transferring into um, our consulting group, uh, our cybersecurity consulting group when I was at Ernst & Young at the time. So that's really where I got my start. And thankfully, I worked for great managers, you know, great people, great, clients, great teams. So yeah, that was, um, that's really kind of how I got my start. And, you know, nice. Years Thank you. I, I appreciate that insight. Yeah. Excellent. So um, Candace and Tish, you guys are with defense contractors who have um, cybersecurity as you know a table stake given the nature of your business. So Candace, we'll start with you. How did you get into cybersecurity? What led you into this career field? So similar to Jackie, I did always have like a affinity for tech, but I joined the military. I was in the Air Force for six years and started out um, help desk, small computer support, and then I ended up in information assurance, which was the old name for cybersecurity before it became marketed, right, to say cybersecurity. So um, when I left the military after six years, I transitioned to Raytheon Missile Systems in Tucson, and I've been with the company for the last almost 16 years. So that's my start. It was military directly into the defense contracting space. And I think it was a natural wow. transition just because, you know, they support military, right? A lot of our um, customers that related to DOD, our Air Force, Army, Navy, all that good stuff. So that's how I got into cybersecurity was the military jump for me. And I'm going to pick up here, Jennifer. And that's actually a very common career path and how many folks in cybersecurity end up where they are. Yeah. And then Tish, I'd like to hear your side as well. So the same thing, you know, similar to Jackie and Candace, you know, I loved math and science in school, you know, got that engineering degree. And, you know, one thing I'll say about the engineering degree, it doesn't matter which engineering degree you get. It's all about engineering teaches you how to solve hard problems. And so just having that computer science or engineering degree helps you to solve hard problems. And that's what cybersecurity is all about. So, you know, I had various roles within Lockheed Martin and three years ago was asked to take this position in cybersecurity. And and of course, it was a no brainer from the perspective of you can't, you know, pick up a, a news feed 
without hearing about some cyber attack, or, you know, on a business, on, you know, what's going on in the Ukraine, uh, you know, world events, just uh, the, the uh, colonial pipeline, you know, so and, and all of our businesses, be it government or, you know, commercial businesses here, we we have to protect our products and our services from cyber attacks. So it's something both personally and professionally, we all need to be aware of. And, you know, so it was a no brainer to come into this cybersecurity organization. So with, with all three of you, you acknowledge that there was a natural transition or it felt like a good fit based on the passion that you had become, um, that you had begun to develop in prior prior roles. Um, so Cecile, I want to ask you, given your role as a penetration tester, aka a hacker, <laughs> can you talk to us about your journey specifically and some of the challenges that you've faced as you've progressed in that specific role, which when when you say cybersecurity, that's what most people think of is is um I guess they're called white hat hackers or Crackers, I'm not even sure of the proper term, but it's a very unique niche, but that's what people think of most often when they think of cybersecurity. So what was your journey like? Cecile, can you hear us? Oh, I think you're on mute. Yes, I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes, sorry. Um, my journey, uh, it's kind of crazy yes. because my journey wasn't really that clear for me. Uh, I've never, I was really not into uh, technology at all. Um, I was born and raised in Cameroon, West Africa, moved to the U.S. when I was about 12 years old. Um, the, the neighborhood that we moved in was very bad. So you could only see two types of people in my neighborhood, right? The one that are breaking the law and the ones that are making the law. So it was very natural for me to just transition into a, a place of trying to be in, in criminal justice. So I went to school, got my degree in criminal justice, and, and that was my path. I wanted to be a lawyer because, you know, that's, that's all I know. So many people always ask me, why, why criminal justice? That was, really my, that was really what made my decision was the, the environment that I grew up in. But eventually, after... After college, I decided to, to not directly go to law school and I started like uh, working. So I worked for juvenile court for a little bit. And then after that, I started venturing into like entrepreneur ventures online and different things like that. And then one day I got hacked and it was a ransom. It was a ransom attack. They sent it into my computer. Of course, I'm sure I clicked something, <laughs> you know, back then I, I didn't know what was going on, but I, I'm sure they sent a link somewhere and I clicked and. So that kind of just really made me realize that how, how can a complete stranger really invade me in that way? So that curiosity of why I became a victim in this particular um, attack really brought a lot of interesting um, aspects. Uh, to, to my life. So I started looking into, this was really my very first time uh, really even thinking how the computer work system, the network, how, what happened, how did it, how, uh, what happened and how did they did, uh, how, how did they go? So eventually what that did is it kind of brought up a curiosity in my, in, inside of me. And one thing that I know I always was passionate about was, you know, protecting um, protecting the good guy from the bad guy, right? I always had that in me. So naturally the hacking aspect of cybersecurity just very came naturally. So through the process of doing all that, I started kind of do, taking different steps and looking around. The biggest yeah. challenge I really had was once I, st I, I was interested in getting into the field, I started looking around. I really didn't see nobody looking like me, especially in the hacking industry, right? So that that held me back over and over and over again until I went to a conference and I met a complete stranger and we were just talking and I told him what I've learned so far and everything. And then he was like, you could do this. You're really smart. It took somebody else to put it in me. 
something that I had this whole time. And then from that on, I just kind of went back to school and um, studied cyber security. Wow. I specialized in, uh, in, in hacking in, the, in that area. And then here, today I am. And I'm always shocked at where I'm standing at this point from where I started five years ago. Wow. Yes. That is an amazing journey, Cecile. Your story is so unique and where you've landed, I think. Um, a, just the curiosity happened. What did I do and how do I not do that in the future? Morphed into this amazing career that, um, quite frankly, I find really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so, Tim, you're in the car. And I hope that you're getting a good cell signal out there at the, uh, the sports complex um, while you're trying to keep an eye on your kiddos. But you're a CISO, and so your strategy has to be crafted with the company's best interest at in mind from um, the higher strategic direction, mission and vision, all the way down to the tactical details that everybody has to implement to keep the company safe. What was your journey like to becoming a CISO, especially for the Social Security Administration, which um, is paramount for, for keeping data secure? Hey, thank you for that question. Um, you know, kind of tap off the last question you had. Tim, can you hear? Yeah, good. Okay. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um, to tap off the last question that you had, you know, my journey is definitely unique go ahead i uh, think that there's a brief delay can you hear me okay yes okay so my journey was kind of unique um you know as a single father uh right out of active duty i always had a passion to work in child care actually to be a, a daycare director and um after achieving that goal of being a director for a school um and i was the only male director out of 760 schools I was really into, you know, basically always problem solving type, you know, really, uh, type situations. But really, I was on the human aspect of problem solving, not really the technical aspect of problem solving. So it was funny to hear problem solving in there because I was always one of those people that like to just solve problems. Um, also being connected. So that's how I started out in the I thought I was going to just be in child care for, you know, I was going to open up my own daycare center. And this is the, the path I was going to go. And I loved it. It was great. But on the military side, I ended up going to a leadership school, uh, officer candidate school. And I'm sitting after graduation, I'm sitting down at a computer working on a project. And a leader comes over to me and says, you know, I want to introduce you to somebody, the CISO of our organization. And I think you would really be good with him because you you do good at problem solving. So I, I was introduced to the security community through another leader. And um went to some courses. I went to a Microsoft boot camp, um, was given some projects and I, you know, I attack any project that I'm given, I will do the best that I can in that project. An example, I always tell people, if you're going to be a broom sweeper, be the best darn broom sweeper there is. And when you attack every problem or every situation you're given with that passion and desire, you will be a winner at the end of it, no matter what the result is. So I started my career with that, always doing that. Well, you naturally, you see, I'm still far away from CISO, by the way. Um, but that opened the door into this field, like you heard Candace talk about information assurance, because that's how long ago this was, by the way. And I was helped building computer emergency response teams back when they were information assurance, you know, and that's what we were doing at the time. Uh, Candace probably remembers, we called them CERT. Um, and so this venture, then I went away from it. You know, because I was really just doing project management, problem solving, went away from it. And um, the military aspect of being deployed in combat, and I served 32 years in the military, and being deployed in combat, there's a strong relation to what we're dealing with in cyber warfare and what we deal with on the ground in, in warfare alone. And so there was a strong passion to figure out how do I communicate what we do on the ground to what we need to be doing in cyberspace. And I saw a, a direct knack with this. So my passion to get into this industry in the government side of the house is where I started my focus. And I started out in VA, um, but I didn't take the job that you would think. 
Wow. Because I always thought, take the job that's available to you, work good at it, do your best at it, and the next door will open. Don't be shooting for the stars at the beginning. Aim for the stars, hit the target along the way, and you will reach the stars, right? Yeah. So I started on this path, and it was so far away from cyber. But being inside it, I started to show those skills that it that represent a good cybersecurity professional. And they and my leadership started to see that. And the next job, I got it. And I was the director of infrastructure cybersecurity management for the Veteran Affairs. Nice. Did a bunch of, uh, you know, had a bunch of opportunities and um, and to be an executive in the government, you have to build on on making sure that they you can have situations or experiences that you can represent. You have the ability to the next level. I saw a CISO job at Social Security Administration. That was my desire. Once I started the passion in in cybersecurity, I wanted to be at the highest you can go. And if you know, the CISO is the highest you can go. So Deputy CISO was open and I applied for it. Um, got selected, and uh, and the rest is history. I'm enjoying it. It's great. When you get to do your passion and desire in life, you feel like you should give the money back, and that's what I'm able to do right now. Yes. I don't know if we lost Jen. I think we lost Jen for a minute, but while we wait for her to come back, I love, love what you said there, Tim, about you know, don't aim for that perfect job in the beginning, right? Aim, aim for the stars, shoot for the stars, but understand that it's a path, it's a journey. And a lot of the times, and, you know, you hear about the cybersecurity, the skills gap, the knowledge gap, the talent gap, right? And there's so many people that want to get into the industry, but they want to start out and be like, oh, I want to be a pen tester, right? Or I want to be an ethical hacker. And I'm like, well, that's great, but it's a journey, right? You, there are certain tasks and jobs and objectives that you have to learn and understand before you get there. And I, I, I don't think a lot of the entry level of talent understand or appreciate that it is a journey. Definitely. So, um, you know, some of those journeys away while we try to get Jen back on, you know, I was a blue team. I was a red team leader, a blue team leader. I was assessor. I did that on the military side, you know, at the ground level, um, you know, those tactical acclimates that you should get along the way. But, uh, you know, still, it is, is clearly, I, I see it all the time. We were, uh, Cecily was at our conference in Texas Cyber Summit just this last year. And there was an Air Force, um, enlisted Air Force, uh, that she had got out of the Air Force. And she was just banging her head off of getting denied on all these jobs because she felt, because of her top secret clearance and the exposure she had in the Air Force, that she was better than the way they were than the than the jobs. I was like, you got to stop that. You're letting your you're denying yourself of the front door. It's looking you in the face, and you're getting in your own way. Don't every job you look at, if you know, you need to look at it as an opportunity. And you're missing. It. And we we just we broke down together because she realized she really was getting in her own way. And uh, and so I'm really hoping I I want to get a follow up. Uh, to see if she actually got that next job because she stopped getting out of her own way and talking herself out of, well, you know, I have these qualifications and these and this experience that this is the only thing I should have. And it's not about settling. I want to make sure that's clear. It's about finding the pathway to those stars and making sure you don't get in your own way along the way. Sorry, Jan, we were putting some filler in there. You were getting. Sorry, guys, I dropped. Don't know what happened. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. So it sounds like we have a couple of different pathways into cybersecurity roles, um, one being the military, another being some college courses and not necessarily a degree in computer science, but at least getting the exposure um, to cybersecurity roles through college. But I wanna ask, there, it feels like there should be a third option where grassroots or smaller community organizations could be that bridge so that those who don't have access to college or someone who doesn't enlist in the military still gets that exposure. So if so, what is that role? So um, Candace, what are your thoughts on grassroots organizations? Do they have a role? And if so, what would that look like? What should that look like? I would definitely say yes. <clears throat> um, oftentimes organizations like Cyber Ally, we do partner with um, certification bodies to offer like programs to help someone coming from 
zero starting their career to kind of building up those skills like we mentioned you know in that little break but there's absolutely a way and i think being a grassroots organization in the community you kind of have a pulse on the the people and they see you as human right i'm not this big organization i'm candace right i'm hosting events at the embark or i'm hosting events at the candle pour right and i'm i'm creating a space for people to kind of um see that it's possible and then have the opportunities and and the the steps to get them um, into into this space. I think it's absolutely possible. And not just Cyber Alley, but there are several organizations that actually have um, tech meetups, right? Um, uh, mentorship uh, calls and meetings and Excellent. coaching calls and meetings. But to me, that's where the impact is when you have those smaller organizations that can touch and see and know the, the pieces in the community that kind of need to be infused or need to have representation to kind of bring a different um, um, aspect or diverse element, whatever that may be, to, to cybersecurity. So for sure, grassroots organizations play a part, a big part, uh, in my mind, uh, when it comes to exposing people to, to this field. Excellent. Um, great news for those who don't have access to college or formal courses that would give them those skills. So Tish, do you have experience with grassroots organizations that can either um, promote awareness or bring the skills to the table for, for those that are underserved? Sure. You know, one thing that, um, you know, we always talk about the bad parts about COVID and there's actually some good things that happened as a result of COVID. And one of the things that schools found how to do was to do remote learning. And, and granted, it may not be as effective as in-person learning, but everybody learns differently. We found a way to do remote learning. We found a way to pass out computers to all the students so that the students that didn't have computers could do kind of this, um, you know, Zoom or Teams or, you know, streaming from the, from the classroom. So, you know, I, I look at that as kind of a grassroots effort that was something we didn't even know we could do. As, and it's only because of COVID that we found a way to do it. And so how do we continue to do that? How do we continue to get underrepresented communities access to those computers, continue to ensure that the community centers for those underrepresented communities have those resources and they have the volunteers to enlighten the, the, the children that are in those communities to that, hey, technology, the examples that, that we all shared from our own personal life of why we got into, into this field is, is just a great example of us each doing it a little differently, but having access to those skills, maybe not initially, but at some point, um, it, and having access to the people who influence us into those. You know, so being able to influence those underrepresented students is really important. Having role models from our organizations to share our experiences so that they realize they can they can get into the cybersecurity field. That you know that that's a great answer because a lot of times exposure to the art of the possible is nine tenths of the battle. Um, if somebody is unaware of what their potential path could be. Um, the exposure itself is a lot of times the awakening or the enlightenment. So, so yes. having, having just talked about, yeah, how do we ensure that cybersecurity education and training programs become more accessible and are inclusive? So, um, Tim, the uh, Texas Cybersecurity Summit is one. Tell me about about your thoughts because you and I have have sat next to each other at dinner before to to talk about this topic. Um, yeah. Tell me your thoughts about how the exposure and the education and training can perpetuate and then grow legs of its own. Yeah, you know this is my passion, so thank you. <laughs> so um, I have been. This is what I do on my volunteer work time. This is what I love to do that keeps me grounded to reality because you're exactly correct. If we don't fix the very entry of understanding in our 
school systems, we will be continuing to tackle a problem backwards. We have to get in front of this. And to me, the best way to get in front of this, evangelize this, is to get it in your school systems. Make this a core requirement in our school systems. Cybersecurity is a team sport. Everything is connected technology. Here's what COVID told me. Even people who sell, this is a weird example, even people who sell toilet paper now have to use IT. Why do I say it that way? Because that was the biggest selling thing during COVID, was it not? And the only way you could get it was to get it off online and out of the brick and mortar. So this is a this is very much a, a big concern. There are programs in place. One of the things that I'm, I'm sorry, you got me on a topic I'm very excited about. Um, one of the programs that I think is really, really trying to tackle this is Cyber Patriot. Cyber Patriot starts in the middle school. You just think about this. If a student was to get involved in Cyber Patriots, no money, no expense on them, get it started in Cyber Patriots in middle school, they will graduate high school with seven years of keyboard experience. That is crazy to think about. Could you imagine what, imagine going back in your life and graduating high school, being on a national competitive cyber team? with seven years of experience, not even touching college yet. And I'm not minimizing college in any way, shape or form. I'm talking about how are we building our OR statements in our resumes, the experience and exposure that these kids graduate with none of, because we're not exposing them to things that give them experience and exposures. We're giving them sit down in a classroom ex uh, experiences. We need to get them hands-on experience. CyberPage is one of those programs that does a great job at that. I challenge every one of you to be a coach and a mentor in this program because it it has gone. We had seven, one year we had 7,600 teams nationwide, and you multiply that out times three to five students on every team. Wow, the numbers are crazy. If you get a chance, go to um, uscyberpatriots.org website and actually look, download their one of their annual reports and look at the statistics. The statistics are mind boggling on how this program alone, and there's others like them, but this is the one I'm gonna, gonna talk about right now, um, is making a difference. It's gotta start earlier on. It's gotta plant that seed. So when that high school student graduates, they're thinking, hey, I wanna look at cybersecurity, as opposed to someone tapping them on the shoulder just sitting in front of the computer saying, Hey, you ever thought about going to do this? Man, I wish I'd have saw this in high school or in middle school and had that trajectory because I lost 32 years of my life doing something or 20 years of my life doing something that I wish I would have done right out of the from the get go. That's how great this I think this industry is and, and, and this profession. So I hope that answers your question because it and if you want to talk more, I would love to, but I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> Well, while you gave this great, beautiful answer, I struggled with audio problems, so I'll just have to watch the replay later when, we're, when we wrap. Um, but uh, Cecile, I actually wanted to ask you the same question, simple because your role is so unique and so specific, but it takes a certain skill set. So for being a penetration tester, how do we ensure that that specific role is harnessed for good and that we teach the right skills for good? Yes, um, I feel like it's kind of funny that you bring that up, right? Because uh, most like most of the time when I tell, especially people within my community that I am an ethical hacker, it's so probably 80 to 90% of the people that automatically thinks criminal, right? Uh, <laughs> They was like, oh my God, so you've been, you've been the one doing all of that. I was like, no, no, let me explain. So I feel like uh, there's a lot of uh, education that needs to be done behind just ethical hackings and pen testing in general at all. So because I feel like once when I touch like my community with, with that aspect, that is not, it is not an area of cybersecurity that they are 
too aware of, right? They kind of, ha it has a negative connotation. Right. And you kind of have to sit there and like explain, no, you actually, you could, you could use the skill to save company, to protect company, to go after the bad guys. Like, just like, and I feel like that education and even uh, offering that as an expert, as an option within like, um, our communities is a it's, it's a big thing and like i said earlier like when i was thinking about it that that was kind of like the mindset that also kept me kept me away because i was like you're looking then you see absolutely nobody you don't see no black no black girl out there who's hacking on top of that black girl who has accent it was really hard for me to like even just overcome that and just and and at the end of the day the technical part is there and I feel like the technical part is very, to me, it has kind of been like the easy part to overcome because if you are determined and you are focused, like a lot of that is repetition over and over and over again. So what become very tricky is problem solving skill and the ability to like look at something and be extremely curious about it to find a different way to obtain something, right? And if you have that yeah. ability, and you get you have that mindset that I could always find something and and that also helped me with my career path in general and that's why when we talk about career path to me I, I always advise people not to like get stuck in a particular career path because you can look and then you just like oh I did this I did that and I did this right but then you look you, you start looking at yourself and like nah I, there's no way I'm gonna do all that because I don't have that background. But there is time, there is space to also be able to forge your own um, your own space within the industry. Yeah. And that, and I think that that is my hacker mindset that kind of comes in when we talk about like career changing and really just being uh, being able to really look at something or look at a situation and be like, hmm, if I can go this way, can I go that way? Right and just uh, uh, put your ducks on the road and figure out exactly right. what you needed in order to be able to like to get in. So uh, uh, grassroots organization are really a, a good thing. I think I did an interview before with Black Girl Hacks and to me, just kind of like like uh, sharing that information with other young black women who are interested in especially hacking, which is a really like, like I said, off, <laughs> off topic when it comes to that industry um it, it's, it's really it's a thing so i feel like we actually even also have to like teach people like the um like the different area of cyber security yeah. right so i don't think it's really right. clear people i want to be in cyber security i'm like okay so which area like what is it and how how you can use some of those skills because we all have that curious mind and we all have a way to work around things but now how do we put it to work in a positive way right. with industry yeah and how do you put all of those pieces together that links you to the career that you want but you right. actually said something cecile that um makes me move on to another thought and um tish i think that you are you know hundreds of people um a year in this field, specifically for top secret security clearance roles. But what are some of the factors that companies need to consider when they're trying to keep DEI um, in the forefront of their minds, but with a focus on cybersecurity? Can you talk about how it's approached from your company? Sure. Um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that we talk about every day. We talk about it in just forming our teams, making sure yep. from a growth perspective that it's not, hey, hey, I'll, I'll be the first one to say, I don't like it when, you know, I don't kind of get pushback from my team. I want everybody's ideas because you, my, if somebody takes my idea and makes it better because they add on, it, it, we all have different backgrounds. We all have different experiences. We've all failed on something. We've all been successful at something. Um, when you share those experiences and, and have that diversity of thought, because you have a diver diverse workforce, you've got that inclusive, diverse workforce where everybody's input matters. 
um, you get a better product, you get a better solution, and you get it right the first time. So it's really important for all of our communities to have that diversity of thought through our people, through their experiences, through, you know, having a junior person, having an experienced person. You know, there's just as much learning today from the senior people to the junior people as there is, as there is the junior people actually sharing their experiences with technology and doing things quicker, faster, um, doing things remote, doing things with little direction, um, going at, you know, my God, our, our, our children would Google the answers to now that they've got jet, chat GPT to help them write their papers. Uh, you know, right. uh, th there's just more agile and flexible that I think, you know, some of our more experienced professionals are because we're stuck in our ways. So having that, that diverse workforce, different experiences and sharing those really gets our teams to the best solutions and the best answers. So we embrace that whole diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of our experiences. I like the way that you phrase diversity of thought simply means you get a better product because somebody else's ideas could cover a gap you don't see yourself or a blind spot that you might have yourself. Um, so that's a really good point. So Candace, from Raytheon's perspective, what are some of the additional things that they consider when they're putting together um, their cybersecurity teams? Um, I would say just looking at it from my perspective when I'm hiring, I think I consider a team overall, where, wherever I'm hiring, whatever space in, in, in my particular region, and I'll look at what's missing on my team. I'll actually do an inventory of who I have, what skills they have, and while I'm going through the process of talking and, and deliberating, I'm hearing personality, I'm hearing the thoughts, and I kind of piece it in my mind, like, okay, they'll fit well here. They'll be a great addition to this team. And I kind of look for those differences versus finding the homogenous person that just fits with what's already there. But how do you add a, a different element than we have? So I think I inherently do that just as part of my interview process or my selection process, just because I know it's important. And I, I know a lot of my peers do the same across the organization. It's really just a part of understanding we have inherent biases, but then also recognizing that and looking for the differences so that you can create a, a more um, cohesive, yes, but diverse team like like Tish uh, mentioned. So that that's something that I practice and I do. And again, peers across Raytheon do as well. I love the fact that you said a skills inventory. What do you have and what do you lack? So you're looking at the gaps, which is a beautiful segue into this last question. Um, given that we know uh, cybersecurity is quite a, a, a diverse set of roles that require a diverse set of skills, how do you create a sustainable pipeline so that you've got um, you know, the college educated or the military or those from grassroots communities where they've gained their skills either on the job or um, in a mentorship type of, of manner. How do you keep those pipelines going? So Jackie, I'll toss it over to you and then we'll follow up with Tim's thoughts on that. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. But how do you create your pipelines, Jackie? For me, it's important to sponsor opportunities. So my my big thing is that I think our underrepresented communities in cyber, whether it's women, whether it's people of color, whether it's our LGBTQIA plus community, right? They are over mentored, but under sponsored. There are not enough opportunities there wow. for them to actually come in and work, right? So it's too many of these and I've seen entry level positions that require three to five years of experience. So to me, that's very unacceptable. I think we need to create true, true entry level positions where someone's come in and they, they, they've proven that they have the understanding, the education, the awareness, the appreciation for cybersecurity, and that they have the willingness and the drive to learn and absorb the information. And for me, that's all I need to see to understand that you're going to be successful. So to have a sustainable pipeline, 
we have to absolutely create opportunities that are truly entry level for the next generation of security practitioners. And like, All right. Like you were saying, sponsor their career and help them gain the skills and gain the expertise. I love that. Tim, I'm interested in your perspective for a sustainable pipeline since you and I, as I mentioned before, were sitting next to each other at dinner one time last year and got to do a really good conversation about how you seed and how you how you farm for next the next generation of talent. Yeah, you know, th um, thank you for this question. You know, this is the second part of my passion. I, I think I sh sitting next to you helped me for this meeting altogether. I don't know what, what, what I was thinking. Um, so <laughs> the issue that I deal with is I have restraints in policy and OPM. And I don't mean that is negative. I mean, is it is what it is. We have to evolve. We have to evolve our HRs. We have to evolve this entire way we used to select and hire people because we were mentored and taught this one model and we got to get out of that. You know, I've heard great ideas that Jackie talked about. I look for passion and desire. I ask questions that represent that. I can send you to a training class, but if you have the passion and desire, you'll sit at the fun of the class when I send you. You will observe and obtain every piece of information because you want to. I can't just, I can't train that. That's inherent to someone's desire to do the job. And, and, and guess what? HR is not looking at that. HR is looking, you got a degree? Check. You have a certification? Check. You have five years of experience? No, nope, I don't see that. I don't even understand what you wrote in here. So I don't even know how to check for that. So we got to get out of that mentality. I will tell you that the president, uh, the presidential committees have come together and they have, have a, a workforce strategy that's trying to change it for government. We're trying to look at a skills-based model on how we can hire. But Jackie's correct. If we don't provide a mentoring ship, a sponsorship type of model that can feed them in to break down that wall, we're not going to get them in the door. So what we do is we go around and we recruit. We go to colleges. We tell them how to get ready for that to even show yourself. Because we need to get you past the HR process so we can sit with you at the interview. And that's what, and in big government, that's the biggest hurdle that we deal with is how do we get you at the interview? Because we have an HR gauntlet that you have to go through to get to the interview. So she's 100% correct. So twofold. One is we have to change the way we hire. Even us, I guarantee you, we had to change the way we thought about this in our in our process, right? AI really has changed this, if you think about it, if someone's hiring remotely, um, I mean, uh, interviewing remotely. So we have to change the way we hire. We got to look at the personal skills. We got to look at the soft skills. We look at the total person. That's what's critical. You know, and if we don't do that, we're never going to beat the diversity issue because why? that's part of the total person. Yeah. That understanding of diversity and because, you know, one of the things I want to talk about that I think is critical that is is that speed to resolution happens with diversity. Think about that problem solving all these puzzles of a problem solving piece together gets you to your solution faster because you're not seeing it from one lens doesn't mean that the one lens doesn't give you an answer. It's just probably not the best answer because it's one sided. So we have to change our HR. We got to be open minded the way we do our hiring processes. And we have to get uh, avenues that do sponsorships and do internships and do apprenticeships. Where did that go? Why did we forget about how important apprenticeships were? I mean, I remember there's a company in, in Texas called the Texas Cy uh, um, Cyber Defenses. I got to sit at their inaugural first graduation back in the day where they had an apprenticeship program, took them from zero to hero. UT has a program like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm advertising UT's program, but they have one. It's a boot camp. It's kind of the same concept, but the, but that apprenticeship model, we do it with, with plumbers. We do it with electricians. Yeah. Why are we not doing it in the yeah. cybersecurity community? Yeah, that, that's I like that. And something that you said resonated. I've heard um, a lot hire for culture, train for skills. Um, you do need to have skills in cybersecurity, but you're right. Entry level positions um, do require sponsors, so they're going to have entry level entry level skills. And so at that point, um, sponsor their career, provide a mentorship, be a sounding board, but help them gain those skills um, as you go. And then you'll you'll 
you know, if they've got that passion and that drive, um, you just wind them up and let them go and they'll, they'll help, uh, you know, grow their career along the way. So thank you so much for the panelists. I do want to pause for a moment to check to see if there are any questions from anybody in the field that is watching and um, how we can start pulling in some experts to start answering these. All right. Let's see. Um, we've got a question. What are the current emerging threats that you guys are starting to see in cybersecurity and how are you addressing them? So that's a pretty broad pan, uh, question, but for the panel, let's throw it out there and, and see if anybody would like to answer that one. I can start. Current emerging threats and how you're addressing them. And I'll, I'll cap off after you, Chris. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we're seeing in the defense industrial base is while, while we compete, uh, you know, I, I'll look at Candace here, we're, we're competitors, right? We, we compete on many contracts between Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, but there's something to be said that, that we as the defense industrial base are really partners when it comes to protecting each other and sharing cybersecurity threats. You know, there's a national board that many of our companies sit on to actually share any any threats and 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 it comes back to us as well. One of the other things that we do is we support small businesses in helping to protect them. So, you know, many small businesses are, are using, you know, Best Buy type services to, to do their business. And, and you know, the, the industry is only as safe as the weakest link. So if one of our suppliers is, is not protected, you know, then my, our products are at risk. So it's really important for us to share amongst industry as well as to protect those small businesses that are key partners to us in providing products to our systems that we that we deliver to our customers so those are some of the things that, that we're doing pass it over to tim you know um spot on you know this area if you watch what's happened since uh you know you, you had solar winds you had log 4j you had the colonial pipeline this has shake shooken up our government in a, in a whole new way of forcing our federal agencies to respond with the shall statements as opposed to should. And those who are not tracking, a shall means you must do versus a should if you want to. Um, so, and the reason why I say these are open source informations that we need to be following. If I'm a, if I'm a software company and I'm selling software, I should be monitoring um the uh, memoranda coming from OMB M2118, where it tells them about secure software or any of the other memorandums about how they need to be looking at secure software. So I wouldn't focus necessarily on what the threat is. I'd be watching why is big government talking, hey, it's important about zero trust. Why is zero trust respond? Why is zero trust important? Do I need to know the secret in order to protect get zero trust? Do I need to watch my neighbor get broke in to understand I better put better locks on my door as well if there's a lot of crime in the area? So we don't need to really understand who's attacking. We need to understand what are we doing to ensure we can prevent those things. And those are all written out and published. So I tell when I go to these uh, events and I'm talking to the vendor, the vendor community, I said, read 2209. It talks about zero trust and why it's important. Read this uh, secure by design. CISA has a great blog and a great site that's helping small governments in this area as well. They've actually been given uh, granted money to be able to help small governments. So they're actually lean, they're actually charged to lean forward. But the one thing I want to talk about that I think is even more critical than all of this is the sharing of information. This idea that we better not tell people we were attacked because that's not good. No, you better you better communicate. Matter of fact, you're charged now. It's by law. You have to have it reported within a certain time frame to uh, the FTC. Right. right. And so, you, you know, that there's a reason why that became a law, because everyone thought, oh, I better protect that information. I better not share as opposed to the civic right to 
to communicate because your neighbor may be next. And if they just get that little bit of insider information that you could have communicated, we could probably have, have contained this attack a little bit more. So that sharing is very critical as well. Yeah, that's a good one, Tim. Sharing of information because um, a rising tide lifts all ships, so to speak. So the more everybody knows about how an attack occurred, um, they can then you know, take steps to counter it. We've got lots of questions in the chat about how somebody were to get into the cybersecurity domain um, if they're either already in um, uh, a career, um, if they're not going to go through the military, if they don't have a degree that's specific to computer science or cybersecurity, how do they get in? So I would I would add to this, I would just say um, making sure you initially like look at your skills. What have you done? Like what what soft skills? I think Tim mentioned that. Do you have and look at that first um, and kind of pay attention to what roles um, are out there so you can kind of inventory. OK, what what do I want to do in the space? And you kind of do a gap analysis. I think it's always that's kind of the first step in my mind. Where do you need to kind of fill in and what skills do you need to kind of get to that that role that you want to kind of move into? So I think. The gap analysis is first and then finding those organizations. We mentioned grassroots organizations that have programs that are free or low cost to kind of at least get the foundational understanding of cybersecurity, what it is. So you can figure out the what you want to do um, to build your career. But that's where it starts. It starts internally because I can't tell you what you want to do. No one can on this panel. It's you kind of looking at looking at what's available and kind of deciding um, what that looks like for you in your career. That, that's my my initial advice to, to make sure you are. Um, Great the answer. Step. Yeah, the first step he said. I was reading the question. He said the first step. So that'd be it to me. You know, the other, the, the, this Tim, the other thing I would say to add to this is um, like you guys didn't know it was Tim amongst everyone else. Um, the other thing I would add to this is apply. You learn through that process as well. You know, and, 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 and oh, by the way, rehearse your, you rehearse your interview concept with somebody with a mentor. And if you go through those processes, you will fine tune getting to the interview and nailing that job. And it does. It's, everyone's treating cybersecurity like it's different than any other job. You know what? It's not. Don't be scared. There is over 30 domains in cybersecurity. I was listening to a, f a friend of mine just the other day at a talk and she, and she represented that. I was like, she's spot on. I mean, we could probably sit here and all talk about, you know, the different domains that we think are in cybersecurity. There is so much to do. Project management is in the, is in the industry. Guess what? It ne it's needed in cybersecurity. So it's, you know, uh, um, acquisitions is needed in cybersecurity. So, so there are so many career opportunities in cybersecurity. Don't get narrow focus. I think Cecily talked about that. It's not just the hackers. There, this industry is so fun and there's so much to do. There is a job for you. Just first put your step forward, apply, learn, reapply, continue this process. Remember, sight on the stars, shoot the target in front of you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, we are running out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you found some value in this. I'm going to turn it over to Renee for some closing remarks. And if you would like to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn, Please don't hesitate to. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Renee, thanks, thanks, Jen. You. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody, for showing up today. Um, thank you so much to our speakers and all your incredible insights and you know just advice. I know that it, it goes a really long way and it is really inspiring for people that are watching. You know, a lot of the comments we've gotten have been from people that are trying to trans transition within cybersecurity, people who are trying to get into cybersecurity. So just knowing that they're like that awareness that there are paths available for them, um, I know is, is really, really just incredible. So thank you to everybody. Um, make sure you follow all of our speakers and, and, and follow their LinkedIn's and, and connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, follow Rock Search. This is, this is, our, this is our little event. We do these every month. Um, but thank you again, guys. And thank you for your time. And, and I look forward to connecting with you all in the, in the future. See you, everybody. Bye, thank you.